coming up on Dialogue Weekend. This year marks 24 years since Hong Kong's return to Chinese sovereignty and the 100th anniversary of the CPC's founding. How has life in Hong Kong changed since the 1997 handover? The annual call-in show with Russian President Vladimir Putin made its return to national television after cancellation due to the pandemic. What has Putin revealed in the four-hour show? And this week's newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Hong Kong on Thursday held various events to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China and the 24th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to the motherland. Meanwhile, one year has passed since the national security law took effect in Hong Kong. So how is the city's social and economic life looking? Will it continue to flourish as a global financial center and one country, two systems? And what to expect from the three major elections in the coming year? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by Lawrence Ma, barrister and chairman of the Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation, and He Jing, attorney at Ji Yang Law. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. I will start with uh, Lawrence here. You know, one year has passed since the implementation of this national security law. Uh, so what visible changes have been achieved or have you uh, witnessed, uh, Lawrence? Oh, yes. Um, the national security law has been a, um, if, the, if, it is, if you call the basic law the most important law for Hong Kong, uh, the national security law would be the second most important law for Hong Kong. It actually stabilized or put Hong Kong back into its right track um, for st stabilizing the, st the, the past uh, riots um, and, and terrorist activities uh, back in uh, 2019. So that, that after the enactment of the um, national security law uh, from, uh, on the um, 30th of June 2020 last year, um, Hong Kong's society has been calm. I mean, the, the, there's been no large-scale riots, there's been no burning of shops and um, uh, uh, injuring of people, uh, uh, innocent people. So the, the, the general environment and society in Hong Kong has been very calm. There has been no large-scale protests or riots so far, which the national secure, security law has achieved uh, much of its uh, uh, objective. Mm -hmm. Well, He Jim, obviously, you know, uh, sitting from Beijing, from the mainland point of view here, uh, the central government's point of view, for example, I mean, stability is a key uh, for the whole nation. Um, I mean, so it's true for Hong Kong, uh, for future development. Without stability, you know, it's just impossible. You don't have the environment to uh, unleash the potential, whatever potential you have in Hong Kong over there. Uh, so in that sense, you know, over the past year, so uh, what do you see uh, the national security law there? Uh, I agree with uh, Lawrence um, that um, this is national security law is really part of a constitutional law framework, right, for Hong Kong uh, by being part, you know, key part of uh, to compatible with uh, the basic law. So it's a uh, provide this is a very essential framework to maintain the law and the order that uh, really gives the, this uh, basic the foundation for, uh, for economy and the social development uh, of Hong Kong. So as, you know, even when we see from, uh, from uh, Beijing, uh, we think that uh, that uh, provides uh, that uh, a very key essential element uh, for, uh, for Hong Kong society. Mm -hmm. Well, Lawrence, uh, you know, in Hong Kong last week, actually, some of the officials uh, uh, mentioned about the Article 23. Uh, and they say, you know, it is um, imperative, basically, for Hong Kong to enact legislation on Article 23 of the basic law. Um, but then people wonder, you know, whether uh, there is enough time uh, f to finish this legislation. Uh, tell us, why is it so important to continue uh, the work of uh, basically enacting Article 23? Well, yes, the, we need further power, the police particularly, uh, more surveillance power to detect potential terrorist activities. If you understand that Hong Kong uh, just two days ago, there was a, a uh, terrorist stepping at the back of a police officer and then committed suicide. Now that is something that we need to stop because as, as I said before, the large scale riots have been stopped, but the individual terrorism 
or uh, people who, are, who, who have been a political fanatic who resort to violence uh, on an individual basis, attacking individual police officers and government officials. Those have to be stopped. Now, with the, the, the national security law hasn't given, it hasn't been, been detailed enough in giving power, detailed surveillance power to the Hong Kong police force so that they can, for example, monitor the Facebook of the individuals so that to pick out people who are potentially vi uh, re resorting to violence against police. So if, if they have, uh, have that information, they might be able to uh, detain or arrest those uh, potential um, uh, 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 culprits before the act was com com committed. So that, that sort of power would be very important. And I anticipated that Article 23 would have a comprehensive co coverage of the surveillance power. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, He Jim, you know, it is still requires some time to truly achieve this stability and uh, requires some extra work, for example, like Article 23. But, uh, you know, despite that, uh, what we have seen is, uh, you know, with the national security law, with the stability coming back, you can see uh, Hong Kong economy, for example, the first quarter, uh, it recorded 7.9% year-on-year year, uh, increase in GDP, uh, basically uh, ending this uh, six-month uh, you know, contraction. Looking into the future, uh, He Jim, it, are you confident, are you optimistic about the future uh, economically, financially of Hong Kong? I personally uh, am very confident about the future of Hong Kong. Um, I think right now, with uh, the national, laws, national security law in place, now people and like, investors, the enterprises, I mean, people have the confidence about uh, how the business can be done, and, then, and that's very crucial. Now, right now, even though we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 the pandemic, um, there are still a lot of restrictions. But uh, people already seen that uh, there are a ton of things are happening right now. People now, in spite of all this uh, discussion or controversy or concerns right, uh, from the, some part of the, the Western countries, but people are often ignore that uh, the basic foundation of the legal framework, the common law framework in Hong Kong are still very, very strong. Uh, there is, uh, uh, Hong Kong is still among the most free economy in the whole world. There are still lots of uh, you know, uh, investments, you know, capital coming to you know, Hong Kong. And now if you think about the, the Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Macau, all this we call the Guangdong, all this uh, southern China, the entire ecosystem are really running strong. Um, so as soon as, I, especially after the border is open, people are probably going to really be present that uh, how many are opportunities are out there. And this is, um, I think, uh, the Hong Kong will, will play a bigger, bigger role in terms of uh, capital markets uh, or the trade system, uh, everything. Um, so I personally have a uh, lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, to second your opinion, uh, He Jing, if you look at the figures in the finance sector, for example, about 50 billion U.S. dollars flowed to the banking system uh, as of the end of last year. And in the first quarter, you know, Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing Limited uh, came third globally in terms of IPOs. So obviously there's the confidence from overseas investors in Hong Kong as a competitive and uh, attractive global financial center. Uh, but Lawrence, if you look at uh, this uh, upcoming year, uh, three elections uh, uh, will be there, for example, uh, including uh, you know, election committee, legislative council, and the chief executive. Uh, What's the prospect of uh, you know, smooth elections, um, you know, which obviously will further strengthen the stability and effectiveness of the governance in Hong Kong? Yes, the um, 1,500 uh, electoral committee members uh, will be elected. They would be, um, many of them would have to pass the political um, uh, threshold of uh, being a patriot. You have to be a patriot. Uh, qualified to be a patriot. Being a patriot means that you have to love your country. What do you mean by loving your country? It means that you have to support uh, the one country, two system. You have to support the return or resumption of, of Hong Kong back to the motherland. So that is something uh, we understand as patriotism. So you have to be a patriot. You cannot col collaborate with foreign powers to overthrow our own government or calling for sanctions of, the, of our governments. So uh, patriots, you have to be a patriot before you can 
get past the first hole uh, to qualify as an electoral committee uh, uh, member or to be elected. Now that is a requirement, and also to be a legislative councillor. You understand the legislative councillors uh, back in the last term have been very um, destructive towards our uh, legislative council business, and fi by filibusterings and all this dragging on the business and not electing the chairman for certain committees. So the, these the for foreign powers have been using these proxies to uh, to go into our system to be elected and to try to overthrow or destabilize our system. So with, with, with this new um, political requirement that patriots have to run Hong Kong, with these new requirements being implemented, I would have thought that the political system in Hong Kong, whether they are the electoral committee members or whether the future legislative councillors, and if including our chief executive, they will all uh, be patriots. And that would be a very important um, implementation of our one country, two system. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, now we turn to Moscow. In his uh, 18th annual televised direct line Q&A session, Russian President Vladimir Putin took questions from the public, stating his positions on issues ranging from COVID-19 to Western sanctions. To find out more, we will speak to Russian defense analyst Pavel Falkenhauer and He Jing. So, uh, Pavel, you know, share with us what are your takeaways of this, you know, four-hour-long uh, interview. Uh, well, mostly, um, Pre President Vladimir Putin was speaking about the COVID uh, uh, epidemic uh, that right now is ravaging Russia. There's the Delta-type virus, and there's growing numbers of people infected and falling ill, and the socioeconomic issues connected to this pandemic, and uh, the authorities are pressing the public to get uh, more vaccinated. Uh, but in, in two cases, uh, Putin uh, uh, ventured into foreign defense policy issues too. Well, obviously, you know, yeah, for the outside world, you know, this, uh, it's the foreign policy uh, and the international relations part that uh, seems to be very interesting. So He Jin, you know, uh, as a Chinese, uh, listening to or watching uh, Mr. Putin giving his opinions about uh, domestic and international issues, so what attracted you the most? Um, there are actually quite a few things. I, I found that um, uh, the interaction was uh, very lively and uh, the President Putin was a very, very uh, candid. Right? I think when people ask him that uh, why didn't you uh, disclose which vaccine you, you used, um, I think he said, well, I don't want to give a certain um, like advantage to a uh, certain vaccine, uh, even though I think he said uh, he's confident about all of them. So he's quite a candid. I also he's candid about inflation. I think, he's, uh, I think he acknowledged that uh, the inflation will be, I think, 4 or 5%, maybe 5%. So he's very straight about it. And another thing I'm, I'm impressed is that uh, the way he is uh, looking at uh, the, the sanctions, the, you know, it's a, it, which could be very sensitive, right, the, the impact of sanctions. And then he basically said that, uh, well, we're not going to do something. I think he meant that uh, the, you know, Russia is going to be a very, um, um, what's called, have a very great uh, discretion about it. He pointed out that uh, like, uh, even the American using a lot of uh, like a Russian-made rocket engine and uh, lots of uh, this uh, was made uh, airplane, uh, maybe Boeing airplanes using the, the Russian made or the rare pet, I think titanium. Um, I think his, uh, his point is that, um, uh, that Russia is, gonna, uh, is not going to do this asymmetrical response. And then he hoped that uh, uh, the Western world will change their attitude about uh, Russia. Um, so I think that kind of um, you know, candid and the personal response on uh, all, all of these very sensitive issues are, are really impressive. Mm -hmm. So, Pavel, on this, uh, you know, pick up on what uh, He Jing has said about, uh, you know, uh, response, the Russian response to the sanctions uh, and uh, pressure from Western countries. Uh, uh, Putin said that, you know, Russian economy uh, continues to grow despite these sanctions and pressures from Washington and uh, Brussels. Uh, so, is that the case? And uh, it seems to the outside world like the Russian economy has been uh, adapting uh, pretty well to those sanctions. Well, yes, Russia adapted to the sanctions regime, 
um, rather good, uh, there are, but there are serious problems there, especially problems in techno technology, because there are a lot of technological uh, connections have been cut, not only between Russia and the West, but also, say, between Russia and Ukraine, because Ukraine before 14 was an uh, integral part of the Russian space industry and defense industry, uh, aeronautics industry. Uh, and, uh, Russia is coping, uh, but uh, the growth of the Russian economy, well, it's not growing fast enough, and everyone would agree with that. Nothing like when the uh, uh, 10 years ago when Russia was booming in, from 2000 to 2010. Now it's more or less, well, more or less stagnating. And this is a problem because that means that uh, household incomes are not growing also for already 12 years, maybe contracting, not seriously, but still. So Russia is very stable financially, politically. Uh, but the problem with growth is also very serious, and the, the Kremlin, uh, President Putin, are trying to address that. Mm -hmm. Well, on the relationship with uh, the West, uh, in particular, this recent flare-up in the Black Sea of a British warship uh, you know, passing near Crimea, uh, Putin said uh, you know, that even if Russia had sunk that ship, the world wouldn't be on the verge of a third world war. Um, so, is he serious, you know, speaking about this Third World War, or is that uh, basically he's speaking to the domestic audience? Pavel? Um, well, that was a signal to the West that Russia, yes, that is, was, was a signal to the West for Russia that Russia is ready to uh, uh, defend its national vital interests with all means available. But also, well, this was, of course, very uh, also uh, domestic. The Russian public since the Cold War has uh, been uh, very afraid of a war, of a nuclear war. And so Putin is sending the message and the Kremlin after the phone-in that the public should be reassured that Russian nuclear capabilities, Russian nuclear deterrence will prevent any, if there even is a local regional confrontation, it will not escalate. The Russian deterrent is going to prevent that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this incident obviously took place only a few days after the summit meeting between Mr. Putin and Mr. Biden from the U.S. Uh, you know, also uh, people mentioned about the U.S. airplane, the, uh, the war plane uh, over there above this uh, Black Sea. Um, so does the incident somehow impact this um, already agreed upon uh, you know, framework to stabilize the relationship between Moscow and Washington? So, Pavel? Uh, the, um, yes, uh, the summit with uh, Biden was very important, seen in Moscow as very important. Uh, as uh, the, the Russia, the Moscow and uh, Washington will be working in a number of working committees will be established to try to stabilize uh, the present standoff, uh, the situation there. Uh, but uh, there's also serious problems. There have been American threats of uh, cyber counterattacks, as they call them. There have been American reports coming in about new cyber attacks, which the Americans claim are, are somehow connected to Russia, which Russia denies. So there's a possibility there. And of course, there is the present standoff in the uh, Black Sea, and uh, to a lesser extent, but still also in the Mediterranean and around Ukraine, which is poten has the potential of a, a destabilization of the situation. Though the Russian military, uh, the Russian chief of general staff, Gerasimov, said he is hopeful that the Russian and American military will find a way to de-escalate, that they can control the situation and prevent it from going from uh, standoffs to actual real uh, skirmishes and shooting. Mm -hmm. Well, He Jing, you know, when uh, people try to interpret uh, the Washington's, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the, the move to 
uh, seek uh, to improve relationship with uh, Moscow. Uh, people would say that's an effort to somehow trying to drive a wedge between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, so far, you know, what's your response to that, you know, given what happened in the Black Sea or the relationship going on between Moscow and Washington there? Uh, and of course, you know, last week we see this extending of this uh, friendship treaty between uh, China and, U and Russia. Well, uh, I think Russia is uh, one of the major world power, um, you know, um, and the U.S. or China or all these uh, important uh, countries in the whole world want to have a very productive and a working relationship with, uh, with Russia, uh, showing all the uh, sufficient amount of respect and really working together. Uh, so one thing to add, there, one thing that I was impressed uh, out of the, 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 the online discussion was a direct line with uh, Putin is that uh, he touches on the global and the climate change a lot. Um, that really shows that uh, all the countries really need to work together. Um, now, in spite of all the geopolitical struggle, or fights, or tension, uh, now if you're looking at uh, the uh, China and the Russia treaty, the extension for another five years again signal um, like the, the, the genuine interest between China and Russia uh, to have this really um, important and working relationship. This one of the key thing for the um, uh, for the treaty is that um, uh, China and Russia are are, are building uh, this. Um, uh, like I think in Chinese language is a strategic uh, consultative or strategic uh, cooperative relationship. That really means that the two countries will have a sufficient amount of opportunities to e exchange or discuss and formulate some sort of alignment on some of the key issues that are impacting the world, you know, economy and the world of politics. So that's the kind of a dialogue, a strategic, strategic relationship are very, very crucial for, uh, for the whole world. Mm -hmm. Well, many thanks to Pavel and He Jin. Let's leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. Three Chinese astronauts, Ni Haishen, Liu Boming, and Tang Hongbo, went into space aboard the Shenzhou 12 about two weeks ago. So what progress have they made in the country's space station core module, Tianhe? And we'll talk to Dr. Yang Yuguang, Professor, China Aerospace Science and Industrial uh, Cooperation. So Yuguang, you know, it has been about uh, two weeks. Uh, tell us, you know, for ordinary folks, People are obviously curious, what are they doing there? You know, what tasks they have done? They are really busy there. They are doing uh, many research, including the engineering research and uh, scientific research. For the engineering research, is mainly prepared for the future construction of our station. You know, that's the, in the future, we uh, astronauts will sit there for about six months for every team. Uh, this time, we, not like before, we use direct use oxygen tanks, but use the water. We bring water and we electrolyze the water to produce oxygen. And also, the uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, dioxide can be recovered, the urine can be re re recovered, and it is very amazing that uh, with the VCD or the visual uh, compression distillation device, with this, the uh, discovered water can be drinkable. So this is the most advanced technology. Exactly. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, w you know, after these two weeks, it was continue to stay in the space station, you know, obviously there's a lot of work. Tell us what are the next steps? I believe the next uh, next uh, critical step will be the EVA. They will have uh, EVA during this. What does that mean, EVA? Uh, it means uh, extravehicular uh, activity or the uh, spacewalk. They will go into the outer space. Uh, so you see that in nineteen uh, in twenty o eight uh, in our during our Shenzhou seven mission, we performed the first EVA of China. But this time, you may notice that during the conversation, the communication between the Chinese president uh, of the, uh, and the astronaut just before that, they are preparing the EVA spacesuit. So uh, they are in the airlock, uh, actually speaking, the front node of this station. Uh, it is very wide, very wide than before. And the two spacesuits were brought from the uh, Tianzhou 2 cargo ship to the station. And they were assembling and testing the EVA spacesuit. 
So obviously there's something you know, special uh, pair of suit, uh, you know, space suit. How, how special are they? You know, how I would say well prepared or must be well prepared because you know this is a very challenging job, space walk. Um, are there any kind of like risks? How challenging they are? You know, for those uh, astronauts over there. Exactly, it's really challenging and risky. We can still remember during the uh, EVA of Shenzhou Seven mission, uh, because of the malfunction of a sensor, there is a fake alert of fire. Mm -hmm. So you see that uh, every single uh, detail can be wrong and may cause uh, damage or even the threaten the life of the astronauts. So uh, this time, although you know that the first EVA, although it is very successful, but we only performed about twenty minutes. So this time, you know that in the future, uh, any, uh, whether for the maintenance, repair for the station or perform the scientific research outside the station in outer space, we need more time for the, this kind of activities or even reach to six hours. So you see that uh, during all these years, since 2008, we have many improvements of our Phaeton space suit. So this time we will test this suit and maybe they will stay outside the station longer. And also this time we will use the uh, robotic arm. With the uh, aid of the robotic arm, we can go to uh, far places uh, than, than before. So this is very very useful, and but this technology must be tested first. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, you know, for people when we talk about spacewalk, it's um, people would say, "Oh, is there a rope <laughs> to, to to ensure the safety of the astronauts, or what kind of technology uh, they are going to use, rely upon?" Say, uh, what you mentioned is. Uh uh, what, what we call the tethered uh, spacesuit or tethered spacewalk. So we use the cables, uh, but not like the first uh, in space. Uh, we don't use the umbilical uh, cables to provide the oxygen. We just use the in independent life support system, but still we need the tether because it is not necessary for this kind of maintenance or some other research on the surface of the station. But actually speaking, they do have some uh, only a few uh, untethered spacewalk in history because you know that during the uh, rescue or capture uh, satellite uh, by a space shuttle in the year, in the many years before they do use this kind of what we call the manned maneuver unit. Uh, with this, we can uh, do we don't need the cable to pr protect themselves. They just can f uh, have a free flying. But still, this is very uh, dangerous, and only in very necessary cases we can use this measure. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's about the technology, it's about the safety, but also it's about the larger environment. In which is different, obviously, from living on Earth. Uh, how important is the outside environment when you conduct the spacewalk, for example? Uh, for example, uh, this time we will read the camera of the outside uh, the station. Uh, reading the camera, we can have a better field of view, and this can only be done by the camera, uh, astronauts. And also, uh, you know that many of the scientific research, for instance, to study the uh, environment influence to the material, we must mount the material uh, outside the station, so we can use all all these uh, EVA activities to uh, make it reality, make this kind of research into reality. Thank you, Yu Guang. Well, with that, we uh, came to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests, and you can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingduo. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Qingduo in one word. Thanks for watching. See you next week. <laughs>